Uh, yes, looks like we're good. All right. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Here we go. Uh, we can get started. So welcome uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining uh, the fifth, uh, yeah, Open Force Field uh, Workshop. Uh, today we will focus on uh, benchmarking Open Force Field by either uh, protein ligand binding free energy calculation and geometry optimization. Uh, yeah, so in the second part of the workshop, we will also have um, uh, yeah, um, interactive session I will guide uh, through uh, that will be focused on using custom uh, analysis to identify uh, FF torsion parameter shortcoming. So I'm Lorenzo D'Amore. I joined the OpenFF team uh, on uh, March this, this year as a postdoctoral, postdoctoral scientist uh, employed by Janssen. And yeah, the idea is essentially that I will be kicking, kicking things off. Uh, then David uh, will tell us more about uh, benchmarking uh, OpenFF with uh, protein ligand binding free energies. Then I'll present the current status of uh, small molecule conformer benchmarking. Uh, we will have then time for uh, discussion, uh, five minute break, and then uh, the interactive session of approximately 45 minutes. And again, time for uh, question and, and answer. So, I'd like to start uh, showing here a kind of uh, map representing uh, overall the open force field uh, framework. Uh, so we have um, an initial force field to start with, which can be translated uh, by the uh, OpenFF toolkit to get into the infrastructure where it can be optimized. And there are essentially two ways to optimize a force field. So the main way uh, is pulling data from quantum mechanics for bond angles and, and torsions. And this is done at the QC archive. Whereas the other way is using uh, open uh, databases containing uh, uh, yeah, essentially condensed phase physical properties, which together with the QC archive constitute the uh, OpenFF data set. Now, all this data is fed uh, into the OpenFF evalu uh, evaluator uh, for automated selection and curation through uh, the force balance developed by the Li Liping Wang uh, group. Uh, and then the optimization essentially is uh, done. We get a force field to assess. So essentially like uh, in every map where there is a pin to indicate uh, your position, today we will be talking about things happening at this point of the infrastructure. Uh, benchmarking is an essential part of the whole process as it allows us to detect uh, any problem uh, related to uh, force field and we can give uh, feedback so that the, the entire process can be repeated, iterated and the force field can uh, improve in, in performance. Uh, as you know, season one uh, benchmarking has been a remarkable uh, and awesome also collaborative uh, effort from pharma partners. Uh, in geometry optimization benchmarks. Uh, protein ligand binding free energies were not in the scope of season one, but uh, yeah, obviously uh, many, many people are interested in uh, uh, using open, uh, open force feed in FI calculation and would like to see open FF assessed against also this metric. Uh, so David Dunn uh, did this benchmarking and will now today uh, present us the, the result. So thanks, David, uh, for uh, joining us and sharing the result uh, with us. Uh, please, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Yeah, as uh, Lorenzo said, I will present the protein ligand benchmarking results, uh, where we basically want to answer the question, how does do the open force field uh, versions and uh, parameters perform in protein ligand binding free energy calculations. And uh, all this work were, was part of my postdoc, which I did uh, during my, yeah, during this postdoc work uh, with the open force field and also at Janssen. And this will be taken over then uh, in the coming month also by Lorenzo. <clears throat> 
can you go on, please, yeah. Lorenzo? Uh, I created a benchmark set uh, out of consisting out of 22 targets, um, 599 ligands and more than 1,100 uh, alchemical perturbations between pairs of ligands. These uh, 22 targets are yeah, listed here and um, they are uh, available in, on GitHub and these are now, uh, is now a versioned um, data set. I didn't create it myself. It's uh, coming from uh, various sources, uh, which are listed also here on the uh, bottom left, uh, right. So the Schrodinger checks data set, which everyone knows quite well. Then Christina Schindler's uh, FEP benchmark set uh, coming from work from, from Merck. And a couple of targets uh, are also from Janssen and from other um, public uh, data uh, sources. All this work um, led to a um, best practices uh, publication, which is uh, written and also listed here, where we tried uh, to yeah, summarize the most important learnings from this, um, from this project and how to build good benchmark data sets uh, where we can benchmark protein free uh, ligand uh, free energy calculations. Uh, the content and also uh, yeah, the, the, the structures might change in the future of this benchmark uh, data set uh, because we always want to improve the quality of the data and uh, maybe also extend the data set by different chemistries, for example, or also for other pur uh, purposes, uh, benchmarking, for example, absolute binding free energy calculations because so far it only focuses on relative binding for energy calculations. And yeah, that's uh, something where I still have questions which we can discuss maybe later. So for example, yeah, how what do we want to see in a future benchmark set? And how can we ensure that still uh, it's still possible to compare new calculations with older one? Because if you change input structures, it will also change the results. Next, please. <clears throat> um, one more. That's yeah. Here, these are now the results um, of all the more than 1,100 perturbations um, done with the open force field 1.0.0, so uh, parsley. And here, in a general overview, uh, where you see as in the radial. Uh, Axis with uh, the experimental free energy difference between a uh, pair of ligands and uh, the polar coordinate shows the difference between the uh, experimental and calculated values using the uh, yeah, free energy calculations with the PMX uh, non equilibrium workflow and the, the, the parameters. You can see here that the targets um, have different performances. They are targets uh, performing very well, for example, the CDK2 in the top. Um, then there are targets with more outliers like the HIF2 alpha in the bottom. And also you have different experimental spreads, dynamic ranges, <clears throat> and number of data points per targets, making some targets better for benchmarking and some others uh, less, um, less good. Next, please. We can also illustrate the difference between experimental and calculated value in such a histogram where each, uh, the, the different colors, you know, the values uh, uh, results for, for the different targets. This is more or less a normal distribution with a um, standard deviation of 2.1 kcal per mole, meaning, yeah, that uh, more than half of the perturbations deviate less than one kcal per mole from experiment. Uh, but we are interested uh, to learn from these results where the where might be problematic uh, parameters or what, what are the, the problems uh, leading to these deviations. And basically we have four possible origins of errors, which are the setup, uh, meaning the starting structures, for example, or the charges, uh, 
um, or charge states in protein and ligands, then the sampling and the model accuracy, so the force field, and finally the experimental data could also be wrong or not uh, suitable for, for comparison to calculations. And to distinguish between the different origins of error, we, we have a couple of things to look at. For example, uh, we can look at the convergence of the calculations and this can be done without even knowing the experimental values. So you have uh, convergence criteria. Um, Lorenzo, next please. Um, which makes it possible to filter <clears throat> these uh, original uh, 1,100 uh, perturbations uh, and only look at converged ones where, in this case, I look at the overlap of the work distribution from the non-equilibrium workflow, as well as the standard deviations over three repeats, which I always run with these uh, calculations. And if it's larger than 1.5 kcal per mole, I uh, consider it not converged or yeah, sampling issues in the calculation. If we do this, we can reduce the standard deviation of the remaining uh, perturbations to 1.5 kcal per mole and increase the number, uh, the, the ratio of successful uh, or uh, le low deviations uh, in the results. <clears throat> and it's more likely to find issues with the force field in this. Uh, filtered perturbations than the, all the perturbations because um, there we might have uh, more sampling issues <clears throat> which are, uh, lead to the errors. Um, yeah. Here uh, I show the, show the same data more or less in a different plot. It's something like a rock curve where in the x-axis we have the um, deviation between experimental and calculated errors and uh, the y-axis shows the ratio of perturbations which uh, are have a threshold uh, with a, have a deviation lower than the, the th uh, threshold. Uh, the thick old uh, pink line is the, the total data set um, consisting out of all targets and we see that if you look at set this uh, target separately, that there are quite some differences. So a couple of targets work really well or um, have lower errors and other targets are um, more problematic. <clears throat> and this could also have, uh, yeah, could be either preparation issues or also maybe force field issues in the specific target. So, and um, we can start also looking at the less good um, targets. <clears throat> or also conclude from this that some data sets or parts of the data sets are not that suitable for this benchmarking exercise. Next, please. Um, on the left, the plot I also showed just before, that's the um, it's again all perturbations, and then we have the filtered perturbations on the right, where you see that in general the, the curves are steeper, <clears throat> but also sometimes the order of the um, perturbations, uh, the uh, order of the targets change. Next, please. Um, for example, if you look at the green and the uh, and blue uh, curve. So for SHP2 and HIF2 alpha, it changes between all perturbations and the filtered perturbations. So for SHP2, a lot of um, calculations or values are filtered out, leading to a steeper curve. And that might be that there's just convergence issues. So difficult perturbations, which would need longer sampling times, for example. And whereas in the HIF2 alpha, the simulations in general converge, but still have uh, large deviations, which might be force field issues or uh, wrong uh, start starting posts. Now um, let's compare the open force field parameters to other force fields. And we can, as, as shown here, is 
um, we compared to three other force fields, so the CGN FF and GAF2 uh, force fields, both uh, calculated with PMX by Vitas uh, GAPSIS, and uh, then the FEP plus um, calculations with the OPLS 3E force fields. In general, um, all four force fields agree with each other and um, provide similar performance with um, non-significant differences, uh, which makes it very difficult to draw general conclusions um, about the force fields and, and, and how, for example, to improve the open force field parameters. So the, the differences are more or less in the noise of, of the sampling and uh, also issues with the starting conformations potentially. Um, one thing to note here, the, the CMET uh, open force field uh, results look quite bad, but that's uh, actually a starting structure issue, which uh, I have resolved, but not yet updated in this plot. And um, as a side note, it's still preliminary data here. It's, it's not uh, the final, which uh, hopefully will be published soon. <clears throat> Um, next, please. We can also look at the different open force field versions. Um, again, here we, we see only differences within uh, the error bars between the force fields, but it looks like we generally improve with the force field versions. So the, the release candidate of the new uh, recently um, released um, Sage force field shows slightly better results in general for the Merck data set in this case. <clears throat> Next. Um, I have, but I should say to the plots before that was really uh, the comparison, uh, the wood mean square deviation based on the um, free energy, uh, relative free energy differences, meaning the delta delta Gs which is more the, um, the, 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 the yeah, raw data, which uh, where we could rather see um, force field differences if we go to um, free energy differences. So delta Gs, uh, there's some post-processing step, um, which like cycle uh, error um, corrections, cycle closure corrections uh, involved, which, might again shadow a bit uh, force field differences. Here, for example, if you look at the SHP2 <clears throat> case, you see quite some differences between uh, the, the three uh, open force field versions. But now if we go to the next slide and look at the delta G correlations, you actually don't see that big differences between uh, the delta Gs for the three open force field versions at the top. <clears throat> And OPLS 3E, also not that uh, much better in the delta, uh, raw delta delta Gs, uh, has a very good performance uh, when looking at the delta Gs. So that's uh, something also to consider that this post processing step um, generally improves um, the, the, the data or the comparison to experiment and uh, also can uh, improve, uh, therefore, or shadows um, the parameter differences. Here, uh, we compare the outliers and also successes, uh, outliers at the left between the three uh, force fields, um, so Parsley, Opel S3E, and GAF2. Uh, and we see that for the outliers, we have um, we, we have many which are specific to the to the different force fields. Whereas for the successes on the right, we have many perturbations which are similar. Or yeah, the, the common um, successes are uh, quite larger in general. And um, we can start looking at these different. Um, uh, they do different subsets and maybe find issues then uh, for the parameters 
in the next slide, Lorenzo, please. So here we can see, for example, one edge on the top left, uh, which is uh, only an outlier in the Earth past Lee force field is uh, in a JNK1 um, data set. And that might be, I'm just, um, yeah, guessing it could be that there's something with a description of the amide bond, which uh, still uh, needs to be improved or was also improved in the following open FF versions. Then <clears throat> um, here in the uh, bottom left, we have uh, uh, an edge, which is only an outlier for the um, open force field and the GAF uh, force field. And that's something which is, uh, yeah, which is a mutation in heterocycles. And here we could also, it could be also that uh, just FEP plus uh, does a better job in sampling this. And uh, uh, therefore we have, um, it's not an outlier with uh, open S3E or that's the, the phosphate parameter description. And finally, if it's if there are outliers for all three force fields, it could also mean that there's some issue with the experimental um, value or that there are set up errors um, which, uh, which lead to wrong um, results. For example, in this MCL one case, we have a meta substituted fennel ring um, at bottom right. So this methyl uh, could be on both uh, sides of the fennel ring and depending on this starting structure, you will get, get different results. And if you pick the, the wrong one, um, you might, uh, yeah, you have an outlier basically in all force fields. And with this, uh, Lorenzo, please, next. I'm coming to a, uh, the conclusions we have uh, got encouraging open F, uh, F results um, for protein ligand free energy uh, calculations across all the versions and even showing slight improvements uh, with the newer versions. But the force field differences are often in the noise of the calculations, and there are still the other origins of errors and deviations from experiment which can also be found in this, uh, which were also found in, in doing this analysis. And uh, especially like the, the uh, um, structure preparation issues. Further work uh, is needed to automatize this benchmarking um, to, to increase the reproducibility and uh, do it more systematically with every new release. And um, finally, yeah, as you have seen, there are other issues uh, with um, the free energy calculations, which lead to, to errors. And so the force field development is only one part of many aspects which have to be developed in parallel. And that's also illustrated on the right that, that we have next to the force field parameters, we have to find good data sets with good uh, high quality experimental values and structures. We can still do a lot of work with simulation planning, meaning which uh, perturbations to simulate at all. Then the sampling is uh, always an issue <clears throat> or there's a base to improve the sampling. And finally, you have the post-processing and analysis uh, step um, where you also can uh, still improve the raw delta delta G values. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I'm open to questions uh, or even if you have, if we have time, we can have a discussion what kind of further analysis you would like to see or calculations and what, what would be a good way to continue the protein ligand benchmarking in the future and uh, how to improve uh, the benchmarking data set. Thank you. So let's maybe stop for a second and see if anyone has questions off the top of their head for David before we move on.
Okay. Yeah, then let's keep going and we'll have another Q&A at the end of Lorenzo's section. Yeah. So, well, thanks, David. Uh, it was a really nice, nice talk. Uh, I guess that we will have time to for, for discussion also at the end of uh, the talk uh, session. So, yeah, let's now focus on uh, small molecule geometry optimization benchmark that have been done in, uh, in season one. So uh, season one has been officially kicked off uh, uh, on January 22, uh, and now it's complete. I already mentioned that uh, has been an awesome collaborative uh, effort to which the pharma partners uh, of the consortium also took part. Uh, we had uh, BSF, uh, Bayer, Boringer Ingelheim, Bristol Myers, Genentech, Janssen, Merck, Roche, Vertex, and Exalpi taking part to this effort and contributing to constitute a proprietary data set of drug molecules actively used in their projects, uh, where over 65,000 optimization have been run. And then the, the pharma partners that are here uh, highlighted uh, in, uh, in blue, uh, also contributed constituting a, a public data set, including also a contribution of uh, from Will, uh, William Swap burning set, uh, where overall uh, more than 70,000 optimization have been run. Uh, the effort was also assisted uh, by four different developers, uh, David Dodson, uh, David Dunn, Jeff Wagner, uh, Josh Horton, and uh, by also for different subject matter experts. Uh, again, Josh Horton, Bill Swoop, uh, Leaping One, and myself. So uh, season one included uh, benchmarks uh, with the uh, GAF, uh, Smirnov, and Parsley Force Field. Smirnov uh, was first uh, released back in 2016, and is essentially an initial port uh, of the um, PARM 99 uh, Frost Force Field, used, but using the Smirnov format. Parsley uh, was first uh, released uh, in 2019, and it's the first uh, incremental generation of Open Force Field, containing a balanced parameter retrained against a fully redesigned quantum uh, chemical set uh, that essentially enable a better uh, uh, coverage. Of, of, uh, of the chemical space and better performance, uh, obviously in regions that are of uh, interest of such chemical space uh, with uh, essentially pharmaceutical uh, relevance. Not included in, uh, in season one, but released only one month ago uh, in uh, July, uh, I guess, yeah. Uh, of this year, uh, we now have Sage, uh, that is the next uh, and current incremental generation of uh, OpenFF, uh, which is uh, focused on a, a refitted set of Van der Waals parameter trained uh, against uh, physical properties uh, data, uh, alongside also with uh, many other uh, uh, improvements in, uh, in, the, in the valence parameters. Uh, we have run uh, geometry optimization on the public uh, OpenFF industry dataset uh, with uh, Smirnov, Parsley, and obviously also Sage, assessing them against uh, quantum mechanical uh, data. Uh, uh, yeah, molecular energy were uh, assessed uh, with uh, delta delta E, consisting uh, uh, in relative uh, MM energies minus uh, QM relative energies. And then geometries were also compared through RMSD and torsion fingerprint de deviation, TFD, uh, which uses a uh, Gaussian weighted uh, 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 torsion angles between uh, uh, the FF optimized geometry and the QM reference geometry, rather than the, uh, yeah, the, the Cartesian difference that we see already in the RMSD. And, should be less dependent uh, than RMSD on molecular sides for uh, stru structural uh, comparison uh, purposes. Uh, we have been able to see that uh, SAGE uh, shows excellent performance. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the histogram of these, these three metrics, 
in particular in RMSD and, and TFD, uh, DMM minimized structure, we have uh, Sage, which is in, in red, uh, and then OpenFF 1.2 parsley in, uh, in violet. So there has been a significant improvement in, uh, in Sage, uh, reproducing the reference QM uh, structure. Uh, whereas in terms of uh, Delta Delta E, uh, we do see relatively uh, well, relatively good performance of Sage, uh, because as we go from from parsley uh, 1.2 to 1.3, there is a slight uh, regression in performance. Uh, but again, from going to from 1.3 back to Sage, it seems that uh, this regression has been uh, uh, solved and things were uh, finally also in, uh, improved. Uh, also, um, yeah, for the OpenFF public, uh, uh, sorry, um, proprietary uh, industry data set, we haven't collected so far enough results to, uh, with Sage to show, to show them, but we can see uh, from the same type of, of histogram that Parsley uh, was significantly, uh, was a significant improvement of, over uh, uh, Smirnov. Uh, with OpenFF 1.2 uh, showing uh, good performance uh, in the assessment of both, uh, uh, yeah, conformational, uh, conformational energies and geometries against uh, quantum quantum mechanics. Uh, yeah, meanwhile, season one was running. Uh, new features uh, were also added to the workflow. For instance, uh, the workflow uh, now supports optimization with uh, OBLS, thanks to, to David Dunn, who has been working uh, to, to roll out this, uh, this ability and to ex execute optimization using the Schrodinger uh, binaries. So essentially, the OpenFF benchmark Schrodinger uh, command tree um, allows uh, the optimization using either uh, both uh, uh, OPLS4 for, for uh, Schrodinger releases from 2021-1 uh, on, and with OPLS3 uh, with Schrodinger releases uh, since 2024 and, and earlier. Uh, also, uh, the, the optimization can be executed uh, with both custom and uh, running uh, the FF builder and default uh, parameters. And essentially it's uh, very easy to use. It uses the same input uh, output behavior uh, as the previous OpenFF benchmark op uh, optimize execute uh, command tree. So it's kind of uh, familiar. Uh, obviously it requires Schrodinger uh, binaries, uh, in particular the FF, the FF builder for custom parameters and uh, macro model to run the optimization and obviously also an active uh, license. Uh, obviously, yeah, uh, result uh, um, obtained with the, with the OPLS uh, uh, force field uh, cannot be shared unless uh, approval has been obtained, uh, granted from, uh, from Schrodinger. So we want to recall that all the partners that uh, want to share their uh, results should uh, uh, yeah, independently get uh, an approval before before uh, doing uh, doing so. And yeah, here uh, to uh, recapitulate a bit. Uh, so season one uh, is complete. Uh, so next step, uh, you know, from already from the last uh, pharma partner call, we aim to publish uh, the result of our uh, benchmark, and Janssen will uh, lead the. Uh, this manuscript uh, uh, effort, um, but uh, we would require from all partners uh, uh, to benchmark uh, OpenFF uh, 2.0 Sage on their proprietary data set to include also uh, this result to the already available uh, aggregated uh, result of GAF, Smirnoff, and, and Pars Parsley. And yeah, uh, we recognize that uh, benchmarking with uh, OBLS for uh, especially, uh, yeah, perhaps running the FF builder to build the custom parameter might not be possible for all uh, partners. Uh, anyway, we, 
we strongly encourage uh, doing so to collect uh, as much OBLS data as possible. Uh, and we would like uh, setting up eventually a proprietary subset, uh, data subset of the main uh, data, data set. Uh, to, uh, well, I have to admit that it will be definitely great to have uh, OBLS results from, from all, uh, all partners. Uh, also, other uh, features that were made uh, available uh, during season one. Um, uh, I'm here referring to additional analysis that were proposed by Bill Swap and Xavier's, uh, Xavier Lucas. So, uh, Bill Swap suggested uh, looking at uh, relative uh, uh, FF energies between each FF optimized conformer and the FF minimum. Uh, on the other end, Xavier Lucas uh, suggested looking at relative uh, FF energies, uh, but this time between the FF conformer, which is um, closer uh, to the QM minimum by uh, RMSD and the, the FF minimum. And these two proposed analyses uh, have been added to the already available uh, compare force field, where we look uh, to uh, delta delta energies uh, between uh, each conformer, so between yeah, the relative uh, FF energy uh, and the QM relative uh, energies and, and match minima, where uh, we look to the FF relative energy, but this time of uh, the J8 uh, FF conformer, which is uh, closest to the QM I conformer by RMSD uh, minus the FF. Uh, reference conformer, which is close, closer to the QM, uh, the QM minimum. So we, we have this um, yeah, additional analysis uh, available. And also, um, while adding uh, these two analysis, in general, code uh, refactoring of the, the whole analysis uh, allows us now to, to run uh, them uh, on different methods. Uh, we can run them as a separate uh, tasks which uh, with, with a remarkable improvement in time consumption. For instance, uh, we have uh, here we, our uh, folder uh, containing uh, the, the result. So we can LS uh, over this, this folder, store the result of the LS, uh, essentially the, all the sub directories containing the, the result with all the FF methods, storing uh, the result of LS in uh, in this um, uh, variable, and we are able uh, essentially to um, to run uh, all the analysis independently uh, as a separate task on on each method. Uh, and for instance, for the in OpenFF industry public uh, dataset, uh, this analysis run in approximately 20, 22 hours, considering five different uh, force field, uh, rather than uh, uh, 22 hours times five because times five because for uh, it would have run uh, let's say yeah uh, first on the first force field the method and then on the other so as a serial uh, let's say execution um, yeah uh, that's that's not all uh, from the community because we also uh see partners independently developing their own custom uh, analysis uh, of the result of the geometry optimization and i'm here referring to thomas fox uh, that um, uh, was able to identify structural shortcoming uh, uh, bonds angles and torsion for uh, specific uh, uh, chemical groups that were optimized with the uh, openff 1.3 and here i'm showing uh, uh, just some of the uh, torsional uh, issues that uh, identified. And also uh, afterwards, Pawan uh, uh, deeply uh, looked at the, uh, to those chemistries uh, and essentially show, showed that uh, in uh, some cases, uh, OpenFF to uh, Sage it's, is able to, uh, yeah, to, to solve, uh, to solve the, these issues. Uh, here, for instance, we can see for the uh, vinyl uh, CO uh, moieties, uh, we, we see here in, uh, in, in Cyan the uh, OpenFF uh, 1.3 uh, structure that is aligned uh, 
with the QM uh, optimized geometry, which is in green. And we see that uh, this uh, torsion angle between uh, uh, one and zero uh, has uh, essentially a deviation uh, of uh, almost 50 degrees uh, with respect to the QM structure, but uh, the same uh, optimized with, uh, with SAGE uh, showed almost uh, no, no, no deviation. Uh, again, we need uh, CO uh, torsion issues for this particular uh, uh, torsion between nine and, and 10. Again, we see that in uh, OpenFF 1.3, we have uh, a deviation of uh, yeah, about uh, 35 degrees with respect to the QM data. Uh, but in, in SAGE, um, this is uh, reduced, so the same torsion deviation reduces to uh, yeah, eight, 18, 15 uh, degrees. So um, let's say that the deviation degrees at the substantially. And instead for uh, this other particular bond, uh, again, for uh, OFF 1.3, we have uh, almost 35 degrees, uh, sorry, yeah, 35 and 40. Uh, degrees deviation, whereas in, in SAGE, these values uh, lowers to 20 and 24 degrees. For this aryl methoxy uh, moiety, in, instead, uh, uh, which is the, the bonds here uh, highlighted between uh, atom eight and, and nine, uh, yeah, the deviation was about uh, 24, 25 de degrees for uh, OFF 1, 1.3. Uh, but this again has been almost completely uh, solved. And we can see that the, in, uh, or in SAGE, we can see that uh, SAGE optimized structure almost uh, overlaps perfectly uh, with the QM optimized uh, structure. And indeed the values are uh, yeah, about uh, just five degrees. And uh, another uh, aryl methoxy uh, uh, moiety that exhibited some, some issue uh, this time. Uh, we can look here uh, either to this bond from three to, to four or this other bond from four to, to five. Uh, yeah, identifying uh, a torsion shortcoming of, uh, yeah, from 30 up to 42 degrees for uh, OFF 1.3. Whereas for, uh, for SAGE, uh, again, these, these values um, lowers uh, substantially to, uh, to 10 degrees or, or even less. Uh, final uh, arin methoxy uh, moieties that were uh, identified uh, uh, as offending for uh, OFF 1.3. Uh, this one highlighted here between uh, atoms one and, and two. Uh, exhibited for uh, OFF 1.3 uh, uh, deviation of yeah almost uh, 50 degrees with respect to the QM optimized structure, but uh, again lowers to just five four degrees with uh, with Sage. Uh, yeah, this this um, uh, sulfonyl uh, vinyl uh, moiety seems still to be. Yeah, kind of problematic also in, in SAGE, but the aryl uh, methoxy moiety uh, yeah, almost uh, overlaps perfectly uh, in, in SAGE. And uh, this last one, uh, yeah, uh, so the, the bond highlighted uh, here from atom zero and, and two, uh, with a deviation of uh, almost 40 degrees for uh, OFF 1.3. Uh, reduces to just 30, about 30 degrees with, uh, with SAGE. So again, uh, uh, we do see that um, many of this uh, concerning chemistry for uh, OFF 1.3 were um, yeah, fixed or uh, improved substantially in, uh, in, in SAGE. And yeah, it was my last uh, slide. Uh, here I draw uh, just uh, very general uh, conclusion. So uh, we have seen that 
benchmarking in a, in, is an essential part uh, within the OpenFF infrastructure. Uh, it may allow uh, the early detection of, uh, of problems and shortcoming that can be fixed be, uh, early by, before uh, uh, the FF release, but can lead also to force field improvements then, thanks to the continuous feed, feedback from the community. Uh, also, we are uh, pretty happy because uh, in general, geometry optimization uh, benchmarking of uh, small molecules has been uh, uh, fully uh, automated. Uh, we are also happy because, uh, as I shown, Sage is showing uh, really promising uh, results, solving some of the issues we have seen for uh, Parsley 1.3 regarding uh, torsion of uh, specific chemistry. Uh, and yeah, it probably constitutes uh, nowadays the best free open source uh, alternative. Uh, and we also have seen um, that important insight uh, can be shared by the OpenFF community as uh, for the case of the uh, proposed uh, analysis or also the, uh, the code to identify geometrical issue the, that was shared by Thomas Fox. And yeah, so we finally have uh, time for uh, discussion now, also including uh, David part uh, and this part, if there are uh, any question. I see that Alberto had a question for yeah. David Hahn. Okay. Yeah, I, I just saw the question in the chat by Alberto. So uh, when running FEP with OPLS, did you use the FF builder to build custom force field, uh, custom force field uh, for all compounds? So the answer to this is yes. And these all the FEP plus calculations were not actually run by me, but uh, I, I took them from the published uh, results. So they were even run with uh, different um, Schrodinger versions and different, uh, yeah, uh, on different uh, environments. So by by Christina Schindler, by people here at Janssen, and oh, that's it. Thank you. Welcome. But uh, you, that makes, of course, um, also the comparison to OpenS uh, quite difficult because first you have. Yeah, you have the custom parameters, then you have a different sampling and a different workflow, which might improve the results over the PMX non-equilibrium workflow, or even the other way around, depending on the perturbations. And um, also, yeah, it's difficult to ensure with this benchmarking that every calculation was really done with the same input structures. Still very impressive work, both Lorenzo and you, David. Thanks very much. Can you go Thank to you, Albert. This is, hi, this is Jun. Can you go to slide number 27 about comparison? The, uh, yeah. 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 Um, have you thought about a way of compare the shape of the curve? Uh, no, no, we, we no. We don't have any way to, to, to sorry, can I ask you what, what do you mean by the shape of the of the cure? In the sense of that maybe there's a difference in the height or the potential. Yeah. Or maybe it's a different location. So you'll be good if like if they are correlated. So in Pfizer, we develop a way to try to compare the shape by look at, at each of the angle whether there's a correlation between QM and the FF potential. Are you doing this with torsion scans or how are you yes. doing yeah. this? Yeah, for the torsion scan. Yeah, uh, so yeah, indeed, uh, let's say that uh, ER, the, the conformer are uh, separated by uh, a torsional barrier. Uh, we are um, essentially developing and uh, trying to include the uh, uh, 
uh, automated uh, torsion scan within the, the OpenFF uh, benchmarking uh, uh, yeah, common tree. So this is something that is uh, now, well, uh, David Dodson is working on, on this. Uh, it's not uh, yet fully automated, but we look uh, forward uh, to, to it. Just to, just to expand upon what Lorenzo said, um, we've started to do some crude analysis, at least for torsion energies in terms of both shape and magnitude. Um, and so Josh Horton did a lot of the work looking into this, but um, our current approach is just to kind of normalize two torsion profiles by the maximum barrier heights and then compute the RMSE. And we find that actually gives a pretty reasonable metric of how well do the shapes agree. So, so definitely we are starting to think about how can we look at kind of correlations and, and especially the shapes of the, the potential energies, but um, it's not directly incorporated into the benchmarking workflow just yet. Okay. Yes, uh, so far we only have looked really at single points on the potential oh. energy surface and all yeah. the torsion or uh, benchmarking is upcoming. Okay. I have another question for this slide. Do you have any plots for these different energy comparisons? Uh, you mean? Uh, like showing different methods uh, based on these comparisons that. Yeah, you, you mean uh, showing the, the, the plots also for uh, Bilswap and uh, Xavier Slugas analysis? Yes. And the uh, other one too, as well, right? The compare force fields and match minima. So all the um, plots that, all the histogram that I showed uh, today yeah. are uh, done with the compare force field. Uh, I, well, there was not enough time to, to run all the analysis uh, over the, uh, well, uh, this extended uh, data set. Uh, yeah, the, the public and the, um, and the proprietary, uh, but for instance, I, I, I do have uh, this kind of plots for the Janssen proprietary data set. Uh, and I, I can see that, uh, yeah, well, it's art without showing any, any, any plot, but uh, uh, they might uh, uh, answer to slightly different question regarding the, uh, the energy comparison uh, metrics. And I have one more question, and that is, so on the, on the following slide, you showed the several structures that improve between 1.2, 1 uh, 1.3 and 2. Yeah. Did this analysis help you improve 1.3 or did the results not go into the improvements? What I'm trying uh, to ask is, is this is the improvement just purely based on the methodology of uh, OpenFF 2.0, and that would be great? Or did this data actually go into the improvement, and then maybe we are overfitting? Uh, no, I maybe someone can can answer better this question. But as far as I know, uh, Sage was not uh, uh, refitted, or yeah, was not. Uh, Done uh, based on this shortcoming of uh, 1.3. Yeah, that's correct. This was uh, this was something we looked at after the release. Um, yeah, the timing happened to work out well that it happened around this around the same time. I think it happened. We in fact probably looked at it while we were preparing the release, but so we were pleased to see that it fixed many of these issues. I think there's maybe one or two that um, Tomas's data brought up that are things we should still work on improving, but. These all just were fixed by the release, but an improved fitting using for two, used for 2.0. And another question is, uh, is the code to identify these issues, is that available? Should we all run it on our uh, internal data sets to, to try to identify some more issues? Uh, yes. So Thomas Fox uh, very kindly shared uh, his code uh, with, with us. Uh, it's a Jupyter notebook. Uh, it's um, available on, on uh, a Slack channel, which now I don't remember exactly which one. But uh, moreover, we, we will, uh, so during the interactive uh, session, we will 
use, let's say, a slightly modified version of his code to just focus on torsional uh, uh, deviation. Okay, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, well, for the sake of um, um, yeah, of the knowledge, uh, his code includes also uh, part to identify uh, bond angle. So rather than only torsion uh, issues, uh, with this code, you can also identify bond angles uh, and proper torsion issues. And bond length. Yeah. Uh, any more question? Maybe I have a question for the whole group. So you have seen now uh, benchmarking of protein ligand free energy calculations and uh, small molecule benchmarking. These are now two different aspects of benchmarking force fields, but one could imagine many other ways of benchmarking force fields and maybe has someone suggestions what uh, you would like to see, what, what kind of benchmarking would be still important to be able to say in the end, yeah, we have a good and uh, general force field which can be used in many applications. One thing we were talking already, and I think this is basically coming, uh, are the, the torsion profiles. Yes. Um, one could also think about conformational ensembles. Because these are, I think, the main main things I at least would, would use the uh, or use uh, force fields for to get an uh, get an idea how how what are the conformations this 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 molecule can adopt and uh, uh, or as a as a starting point before before actually doing uh, quantum cal um, calculations if the force field is good enough that I don't need to do the the lengthy quantum things um, this is certainly something uh, that would be interesting for me. So it comes down to a relative, uh, get, uh, do we get the relative uh, um, um, minima uh, correct or the ranking of the minima is somewhat uh, correct? Yeah. yeah and, and, uh, data we, go ahead. Sorry. That data we should have with the, this data set, right? It's just a question of doing the analysis to answer your question, Thomas. Yeah, but I think right now what uh, what the analysis does it t it throws out the relative uh, energies of the of the the, um, the conformers. This is a, a confirm uh, this is an information that's not captured. Maybe not even is is not even in the in the um, uh, JSONs that are produced. I'm not quite sure, but I had the impression this 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 information of the relative uh, energies of the conformations is somewhat somewhat lost. At least in the, the way it's analyzed right now, of course you're right. The the data is there because you have the quantum um, quantum energies and the uh, and the force field energies. But maybe this is uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I totally understand what you would what you would look at <clears throat> in that um, analysis much other than what we're already doing. So maybe I need you explain it. I need you to explain it a little better because it. I mean, I like the, I, if, if, it, if there's something there we're not doing, I like the idea of it. And the thing that we are doing in, in the, deep, the relative conformer energy analysis we currently have is that we look at the energy differences between conformers in MM, and we look at the error of those relative to the QM energy differences for the same conformers, which is a measure or an attempt at measuring how accurate the conformer energetics are. But there may be other ways of doing that that we haven't yet hit on. To be honest, I haven't I have never had the time to look into these new uh, these new energy me measures that um, you that were discussed and you just presented this you know, stuff by um, um, 
so my my feeling was that I would what I what I would love to have is kind of an energy rank or kind of a, a ranking. Is the ranking of the confirmations in QM the same as it is in the in MM? So are the is the lowest energy minimum the lowest energy in QM? Is the second lowest the second lowest in QM? But probably this is something that's captured there. You know, yeah, I'm not sure that we've looked at ranking specifically, so that might be something to check. I don't know. Um, what are the guys involved in that benchmarking thing? Yeah, I think that'd be a good idea, like a, a row um, or a, a tau, like a ranking coefficient. That's actually, a, that's a very good idea. Yeah, it's, it's a bit captured in the DDE because if the ranking is wrong, then the DDEs will be off quite well, but yeah, not completely. But what I uh, wanted to add is what I understood also the first from Thomas is that it sounds a bit like ensemble sounds like MD. So it's it would be a more applied benchmarking that you, for example, run molecular dynamic simulations and then see uh, whether you end up with different ensembles, uh, with, yeah, with different uh, clusters of um, conformers, which also would tell you whether the barriers are about the same size, yeah, um, so the same height, um, which we don't capture not right now in a, in a benchmark. Um, so, but of course, it's there then a larger uncertainty whether again. It's a bit more like the protein ligand benchmarking. Because... Yeah, definitely much more more work to, to be done. Kind of uh, getting getting five five or ten confirmations for one molecule. That's that's relatively easy. But doing setting it up with MD simulation, doing as MD simulation, analyzing the MD simulation, I'm not quite sure how feasible that is for for thousands of of compounds. Yeah. So if there are no more questions, I guess that we can uh, move further. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, as you see, we will have a five minute break uh, before the interactive session. Uh, what I was, I want just to show you is to, uh, uh, yeah, this page to uh, download the, the material. Also, I uh, hope that you already uh, downloaded and did the, the, the installation. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, use this uh, quick break to, to do so. Uh, yeah, and essentially we will be looking uh, uh, to this particular chemistry that uh, has been identified uh, with this uh, analysis. It's um, uh, essentially uh, out of sync um, torsion profile between the QM and uh, of NFF uh, 1.3 uh, torsion profile of this um, trifluoromethyl uh, pyridine. Uh, and we will look uh, into a data set containing uh, this, this chemistry uh, to see whether we are able to, to identify the, the issue. So we can see, we can be back at, uh, at 10 minutes, yeah, 11. Yeah, let's uh, restart this at 11 minutes past the hour. Okay, yeah.
Uh, is there anyone? Is there anyone that needs uh, help with the installation or running the the notebook? Essentially, there are two ways to to running it. Uh, you can run either uh, on your local uh, laptop or computer, or by uh, yeah, install all the environment on a remote machine and then uh, use a remote Jupyter notebook. That will be the, the, the approach that I will be using. So I can show you how to, how to set up the, the Jupyter notebook uh, remotely because yeah, I do need to do it myself. And I'll also add for anyone running locally who's having trouble, you can go ahead and um, if you mention it in the chat, I can pull you into a breakout room and help you get everything set up. Okay, so uh, first things I'm thing I'm doing it's to create an SSH tunnel to the remote machine where the notebook uh, will be running. So to do so, I do. So essentially, I'm here specifying the local port and the remote port. Uh, local host is in here in the middle. And then my credential. And then you type just your username uh, at the remote uh, machine you are uh, going to connect. Yeah, it might take a while. Okay, now I cd into the directory that contains the, the material. And I conduct activate uh, the, the environment. Uh, my environment name uh, is called the uh, a little bit differently, but you should type uh, conda activate, yeah, 2021 benchmark uh, workshop. And then once activated, just type uh, Jupyter notebook. Uh, then I'd like to specify no browser to avoid opening a, a browser window on the remote machine. And also we need to specify the, the remote port that should be the same that we specified here. So. Uh, everyone got the, the same. So when, when you start uh, running the Jupyter notebook, you should get uh, something like this. And essentially I'm going to copy paste this entirely on my browser. And yeah, I'm ready to offer the with the with the Jupyter notebook. Uh, yeah, any question help uh, needed to reach this point?
well, if not, I can go ahead. So yeah, okay, <laughs> welcome uh, to this benchmark uh, workshop live session. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, we will be looking uh, to uh, this torsion shortcoming regarding this trifluoromethyl uh, pyridine uh, group. And yeah, so the learning objective of this uh, live session are to obviously identify the torsion violation uh, that are contained in our uh, data frame and then to identify which force field parameter are associated with these uh, specific uh, torsion violations. Uh, and finally, we want to visualize uh, the, the violation frequency, so how many times this violation is uh, committed as a function of the specific torsion uh, parameter. Uh, yeah, well, the, the notebook is uh, already compiled. I will uh, go briefly through it, uh, explaining it. Um, you can stop me anytime for asking me questions. This is my first time ever uh, doing a, a live coding uh, session. So uh, please uh, stop me at any time uh, to have more uh, yeah, explanation if something is uh not completely uh, uh clear and yeah so we start uh, loading uh, this bunch um, of uh, yeah could you zoom in a little bit so the text is larger oh yeah thank you great that's perfect okay yeah that's better thanks jeffrey uh yeah so we can start uh, so uh essentially what you need to do is to shift uh, enter in uh, each cell to execute it. If you just type uh, enter, you see that you just get a new line. So to execute uh, each cell, you need to, to hold down the shift key and to, to press enter. Yeah, by doing so in this first uh, cell, we uh, load a bunch of uh, 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 Python packages which are uh, required to, to run the, the analysis. So uh, first part, uh, identify uh, torsion violation. Uh, so this first part of the code uh, section, uh, we load uh, our SDF files uh, of the QM and the DMM methods. Then it will go through all the torsions uh, of these uh, uh, QM and MM molecules to compare uh, them, uh, to compare the QM and the MM values, and we'll output the, the conformers that exhibit a torsion deviation, which is larger uh, to a given threshold that we will, uh, we will provide. Uh, now, since uh, uh, a given torsion can be defined, well, it's defined by four uh, uh, atom indices, but actually the bond which is uh, rotating is always uh, defined by the two middle indices among these four uh, torsional indices. Uh, then a single rotatable bond uh, might be identified as an outlier multiple times uh, since it is central to multiple torsional, uh, to multiple torsions. Uh, so the last part of this uh, first code section uh, essentially will, uh, will be used to remove uh, these uh, duplicates, these, uh, these outliers. So uh, here we, uh, we define essentially a, a list of uh, SDF files uh, using these, um, um, yeah, sorry, no, here we, we, we define the, the location where the, uh, our SDF files are, uh, are stored. Uh, and then uh, we create uh, a list to then go uh, uh, over uh, with GLOB over this, um, this folder containing all our uh, SDF file. Uh, we will use uh, Panda tools load SDF to load each single uh, SDF as a, a separate uh, data frame. And then we will uh, recursively uh, append this, uh, this data frame to our uh, QM data list. So essentially this will be a list uh, of uh, data frames. 
uh, and then we uh, concatenate this uh, this data uh, and we assign the the following uh, uh, columns to to this uh, data frame and then we well this is just to modify the column name uh, to call uh, essentially conformer id this column conformer id rather than conformer index this column mol id rather than molecule index and and so on. And then we do the same for the DMM data. It is exactly the, the same is done for the DMM data. We concatenate also the DMM data. We slightly modify the column of, uh, of this data frame. And then we merge these two data frame based on the, uh, on the ID column. So at the end, we, we, we get a data, a data frame containing both our QM and our uh, MM, MM data. Uh, yeah, well, here I'm just uh, uh, renaming uh, this, uh, this column um, this way. So energy QM kigal per, uh, per mole. Uh, and then I'm uh, also uh, assigning a, a float uh, float number for for this uh, for this particular value, uh, and then uh, we we are sorting the, the the values of this resulting data frame that merged the, the QM and the MM data. We sort the the values uh, based on uh, these two columns, mol ID and the energy of the QM method, <clears throat> and then we group by uh, by mol ID, mol ID first, so we can execute it. You will uh, see that nothing is happening, but ex essentially, we uh, got this data frame, which is uh, our initial data frame. We can have a look to it. Oh my God. Yeah, it's not very informative because it contains, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the, the mall is, uh, yeah. Well, we can forget about this. <laughs> it's not very informative. Uh, but now we know that we have loaded uh, all our data in this uh, in this data frame, and we can proceed with the uh, with the analysis. So essentially, this cell will uh, it's the the analysis, the actual analysis part that will go uh, through all the all the torsion to identify to essentially um, uh, yeah look to the to the QM structure and the MM structure and output all the conformer that uh, uh, exhibit uh, torsion deviation of uh, more than 30 degrees. This is the torsion uh, um, threshold that we are uh, defining. Obviously you can play around and yeah, lower and or increasing this, um, this threshold, but uh, for now we will uh, use 30 degrees as uh, yeah, torsion threshold. Uh, and yeah, uh, essentially afterwards, uh, you can also consider uh, uh, uncommenting uh, this, this line that will uh, uh, filter out uh, the, so the torsion that contains um, this, this atom. Uh, and in, in this way, the code will not look for uh, violation uh, if the torsion ends with the uh, yeah, hydrogen, fluorine, uh, chlorine, or the, the atoms that are defined uh, here. You can play afterwards, but uh, for now we will uh, go straight forward with the, with the analysis. So what this uh, cell and this code uh, does, so it goes uh, over each rows of uh, our data frame that 
stores the, the QM and the MM data. Uh, then we, we define our uh, mole one, essentially will be uh, our QM molecule, mole two, the uh, OpenFF uh, molecule. We get the, the properties of uh, the QM molecule, and then we get the, the conformers of the, of the two molecules, and then we can uh, search for all the dihedrals of uh, IJKL uh, indices uh, by iterating over uh, all the, as I said uh, before, the middle indices, so over all the JK uh, bonds. So, uh, we get, we first uh, iterate uh, here over here, getting all the bonds of the QM uh, molecule. And we get the atom J by getting uh, the, the begin of, of the, the, yeah, so the first atom involved in, in this bond and the K atom, so, the one involved in these indices by getting the, the end, the ending of this of this J K bond, and then uh, well, so we have essentially defined the uh, bond. Now we we want to extend this bond uh, to neighbors, also to include the, the 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 other bonds that will form uh, the, the the torsion. So uh, we go. Uh, we iterate over uh, the bonded uh, neighbors of J uh, that first that are not K. So essentially we iterate over, uh, over here and then we do the other way around. So we iterate over all the, the, the neighbors of K that are not J. So essentially we, we, we iterate over uh, we iterate here with this part of the of the code, and then uh, well, once we have uh, essentially defined our uh, our torsion, uh, we want to compute the, the the difference between the the QM torsion value and the DMM torsion value, and we do uh, this here essentially. So. Uh, we define T1. Uh, if you remember mole one, it's the QM mole uh, molecule. So T1 will be the QM torsion. Uh, we get the, the dihedral of the QM conformer, and then we get all the, the atom uh, indices, I, J, K, and L. Uh, we do the same for uh, the, the MM molecule. And then uh, essentially we want to test whether this, uh, the difference in, in angle between the QM and the MM uh, is uh, exceed, yeah, it's more than, than the given uh, threshold. Uh, and if this happen, we, we record the evaluation. So we compute the, the difference between the QM torsion and the, the MM torsion. Uh, yeah, here essentially we are just uh, rounding the uh, by two decimal numbers, by two decimal uh, values, and uh, yeah, this uh, is a bit uh, code artifact. Uh, the, the actual difference might be more than uh, uh, 180 degrees, and well, if this is the the case, we want to renormalize this this difference. So we take the absolute value. Uh, uh, removing from this difference uh, 36, uh, uh, 360 de degrees. Um, and yeah, if uh, the, the difference it's uh, exceed the, our uh, specified uh, threshold uh, uh, value, then we, we append uh, to this, um, to this list, we append the uh, the name or the name of each uh, I, J, K, and L uh, atom. So the, the symbol of the atom and also the, the indices. 
we are here uh, adding uh, one value to the indices because essentially in the uh, in Python, uh, yeah, number are zero based, uh, whereas in yeah many of the um, uh, program that you might use to visualize a, a molecule, essentially when we uh, check and we look to the labels, we see one based uh, indices. So I uh, I think that it's um, well it's a added value to get uh, uh, yeah at the end a data frame that contains uh, the indices in uh, one based number so that we can directly visually compare uh, with a, a program like uh, yeah uh, Avogadro or uh, I don't know any any program Pymol. Uh, but then you will see that we will also use uh, zero based uh, we we will come back to also to zero based uh, indices when we will compare uh, these indices with the uh, the OpenFF uh, parameter because the OpenFF parameter uh, are Pythonic and also used uh, uses um, zero based uh, indices. Uh, yeah, so at the end uh, we can uh, convert this uh, this list in into a data frame. We do this here, and we specified uh, the. The, the columns of this uh, data frame, uh, ID, the name of the four atoms, the indices of the four atoms, and yeah, the QM torsion value, the MM or the OpenFF torsion value, and then the, the difference. Um, this looks yeah, good. Well, essentially, I think. We've got a pretty expert audience on, and so uh, it's probably okay if you want to move a little bit faster. Yeah, yeah, I see that uh, timing is running out. Uh, so we can have a look to, to this uh, data frame, how it looks like. So essentially, we we have all the conformer that exhibited a, a torsion, um, so uh, yeah, a torsion difference. Uh, between QM and MM of more than 30 degrees. But uh, as we already mentioned, uh, there are torsion duplicates here. For instance, we see that the central bond that is rotating is, is the same, but just uh, yeah, this last uh, atom indices is, is changing. So we want to get rid of this um, uh, further in the good. We want to get rid of, the, of these the duplicates. We can... Uh, Actually, preview uh, which are the uh, yeah the, the molecules that are uh, exhibiting a torsion uh, violation. For instance, I'm here uh, previewing uh, uh, the index index of the data frame uh, 137, which will be this one. So this this molecule, we can have a look and. Indeed, you see that uh, it it exhibits this uh, difference between uh, see, in this uh, CF3 group uh, between the QM and the OpenFF 1.3 optimized structures. So uh, yeah, essentially what I do here is just to uh, yeah rename some column and drop uh, the the values of the QM torsion, the FF torsion, and uh, the difference, since we are not interested anymore uh, in uh, in this. And yeah, well, I here I I've put uh, some challenge, but uh, maybe for the sake of time, it is better if we skip uh, this this part. Also, the solution uh, is already provided and was needed to further uh, advance in, uh, in in the code. Uh, so we can uh, essentially um, have a tuple containing uh, now the the zero based uh, indices. So I'm uh, removing uh, one to to get back uh, a tuple with uh, the the indices of the torsion in a zero based uh, number because then we can further compare uh, this tuple uh, with. Uh, uh, the, the OpenFF uh, parameter indices. And 
this, uh, this cell, so this code block, uh, will actually remove the, the, the duplicates, the torsion uh, duplicates that we, we, see, we see here. It will remove all this, this kind of duplicates. And I can finally have uh, a data frame that contains the unique uh, violation. So each uh, rotating bond, now it's taken uh, only, only once. And you see we, we get uh, this unique, uh, data, uh, unique violation data frame containing uh, our uh, conformer, the, uh, the atom types, the atom indices, in one based uh, indices to be comparable with uh, any visualization, visualization program and uh, zero based uh, indices that will be further compared uh, with the parameter. Well, also we can skip uh, this, this challenge. You can play afterwards with uh, the, the notebook. And yeah, so in this uh, second part of the, of the code, we want, so once we got our uh, data frame containing uh, all the unique uh, uh, rotating bond violation, we want to uh, essentially identify which force field uh, parameter are uh, associated with a specific uh, torsion violation. Um, so in order to do so, we build a, a dictionary containing uh, all the parameters that are uh, exercised by the, the conformer that produced a uh, violation, uh, as we saw in the previous data frame. And afterwards, uh, again, we have to, we need to search uh, the middle indices of the violating torsion that will match the middle indices of the torsion parameter to associate uh, yeah, the, the, the scene violation with the, with the torsion parameter. So to do so, we need to, uh, to load the OpenFF uh, molecule and uh, topology, and also to import uh, our OpenFF uh, force field. So uh, yeah, we want to build uh, this, this dictionary. And so we first load the uh, uh, one conformer for each uh, molecule that contains a, a violation here. And then we load the, the death molecules in, in a Panda data frame. Uh, and then essentially we, yeah, we, we load uh, our, uh, our force field and we create this, uh, this dictionary uh, containing the DFF parameter for all the unique conformer that uh, produced the a violation. This will take uh, a while. Uh, this is obviously a tweaked and reduced uh, data set, but if you execute this uh, analysis and this Jupyter notebook uh, over a real data frame containing uh, uh, thousand maybe dozens of thousands of uh, different conformer, you will see that uh, essentially this loading uh, all the FF parameter uh, will uh, into a dictionary will take, uh, will take a while. So now uh, we want to essentially um, associate to each uh, torsion violation uh, that was identified by the first part of the, of the code to a force field uh, parameter, which is uh, present in this, in this dictionary that we just uh, created. And we do, we do so in, uh, in, this, in this cell. Uh, and we can have a look to what we, we get. So we have uh, essentially uh, yeah, associated uh, the, uh, the uh, violation uh, identified by, by the analysis, exhibiting a certain violin violation indices, uh, 
with the parameter, uh, so the force field uh, parameter IDs, uh, not with the same indices, but uh, having, so matching the two middle indices since we are interested uh, obviously in the rotating bond. So it might happen that for instance, uh, for a specific rotating bond, there are uh, more um, FF parameter uh, uh, associated because the, the terminal uh, bonds are, are different. So uh, here we match um, any FF parameter that uh, uh, has the, the, the two middle indices. And once we get this, uh, this uh, data frame, we can uh, essentially visualize the, the, the result. So we can visualize um, the frequency, the violation frequency as a function of torsion parameter. We import the packages that is needed uh, for, uh, for plots. And we can uh, essentially visualize this first uh, plot, uh, which just takes into account the, the number. So the number of uh, violation that are uh, counted for a specific uh, um, open FF uh, torsion parameter. And here we see that uh, T16, which is uh, indeed uh, the parameter that is associated uh, with this um, yeah, this particular uh, chemistry uh, produced over uh, 250 violation. And essentially this is because the data frame is, uh, is triggered that, and contains uh, many of these, uh, of molecules containing these moieties on, on purpose to, to show you clearly the, the, the result. But obviously uh, now we can argue that, uh, um, yeah, this plot is counting uh, the, the number of times uh, a parameter has produced a violation, but uh, at the same time, this parameter uh, has been uh, used many times. So it's, uh, this parameter has been uh, uh, overrepresented in, in our data frame because uh, our data frame contains uh, many molecules with, this, uh, with the moiety that is associated with this parameter. So we are sure that uh, T17 looks bad. Uh, but we are not still sure it's because just T17, it's a, a parameter that has been assigned uh, to too many torsion in, in our data frame. So we can normalize uh, this uh, violation count by the number of time that uh, each parameter uh, has been assigned. And to do so, uh, we, we can use the coverage uh, report uh, that we normally, um, we normally run uh, in, um, uh, in, during our uh, uh, benchmarking, uh, and we can, uh, yeah, we can uh, load uh, the, um, yeah, the coverage report for the for the torsions, and essentially we can uh, finally normalize uh, the absolute violation count, dividing uh, by the number of time. Uh, uh, the parameter has been uh, exercised and multiplied to by a hundred to have a kind of uh, yeah relative uh, normalized uh, violation. And if we now uh, plot the result taking into account these uh, sorry this normalized uh, uh, violation count. Uh, we see, so essentially uh, here we see that uh, only T17 is um, producing uh, its, uh, well, um, concerning, but uh, once we normalize the, uh, the, the violation count also by the, by the number of times uh, that the, each parameter has been exercised in, in our data frame, well, we can still see that uh, T17 uh, uh, is a uh, concerning parameter, but there are also uh, other parameters which are uh, 
not very used very much in, in our data frame, uh, but are producing a certain number of violations. So at the end, uh, the, the relative violation count will be um, uh, in some way will be uh, also, also high. Uh, when, uh, so when we do this, this plot, uh, more than having a normal uh, bar plot, uh, we also want to, uh, to color uh, the, the bars uh, with this palette. So taking into account, uh, again, the, the violation, so the absolute violation count as we did uh, essentially here. So uh, the colors will be assigned uh, by the number of times that the, the violation has been produced. So that at the end, uh, let's say that we can, we could focus uh, on parameters that uh, exhibit either, uh, um, well, both uh, high relative uh, violation, but also produces, uh, so are colored uh, red because they produce uh, um, uh, an eye uh, violation, uh, violation count number. And yeah, so we are really looking forward to uh, uh, working with this uh, analysis. And uh, well, one thing that I'm, I'm doing uh, right now uh, that is not in the scope of obviously of this um, Jupyter notebook is uh, essentially to run uh, a torsion scan. Uh, we can run a torsion scan uh, for uh, over all the atoms that are contained uh, in parameters that we uh, we think that uh, might be concerning, or we can simply uh, run uh, a torsion scan for uh, all the torsion that are uh, identified uh, in the in, by the. The, the analysis. So uh, yeah, we really look forward uh, to, to it. Uh, and yeah, maybe in, in the next uh, near future, uh, uh, we will show with you the, the result also of uh, a torsion scan uh, benchmark done uh, using these, these analysis. Uh, yeah, I know I, I was rushing a bit, so I don't know if you have uh, any, any question regarding this uh, notebook. I will be happy to. Yes, Lawrence, I actually have one. Uh, thanks yeah. a lot. It was uh, really nice. And uh, especially all these, this, the, the visualization and the, the, um, the kind of pulling out the, the torsion is something I never got around to do. So now it's basically presented to me on a plate. Um, so um, is, the, is the interpretation, just to be sure I understood what you do here, that for T T17, you have uh, 260 violations and 35% or 30% of the, of the, um, of the torsion, uh, uh, 35% of the, when this, this, um, uh, this torsion shows up somewhere, it's, it's, it, it's, it's more than 30 degrees off from the QM. Uh, risk. Yeah, so uh, re regarding the absolute uh, violation count, so 260, this is exactly the number of times that uh, this parameter has been uh, seen in, in, a, in a torsion violation. Regarding the, this, actually percentage, so the relative uh, violation, uh, it's a bit um, controversial to, to give, um, uh, let's say a straightforward uh, interpretation saying for instance that 30% of the time that the parameter, so it's not actually exactly that 30% of the, or 35% of the time this parameter uh, um, has produced uh, a violation with respect to the times that has been uh, exercised, uh, but it's a kind of uh, weighted, uh, so it's a kind of weighted uh, matrix uh, to normalize uh, somehow by the number of times that uh, the, 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 the parameter has been exercised. So it has, uh, I'm afraid that I, and I cannot provide a, I want to say a, a physical, um, straightforward, uh, um, yeah, value Lorenzo, for, yeah. Lorenzo, it, the value would be one if it occurred no more often in molecules with violations. 
than it occurs in the rest of the data set, right? Uh, sorry, can you say again? The value will be it, one? I think the value on the vertical axis, wouldn't that be one if it occurs at this, in the same frequency in molecules with violations as in the rest of the data set? Yeah, in principle, uh, yeah, should be should be one. So I think it's like an overrepresentation factor, so it's okay, thirty times yep. more likely to occur in molecules with violations than in the data set as a whole. So yeah, I might add that there's two kind of confounding factors here. So number one is uh, this data set was selected to exhibit problems with T17. Uh, yeah. So in a in an unbiased data set, this frequency wouldn't look so bad, but this is kind of made for for ease of the workshop. Number two is that the number is a little more complicated than that because we're counting by number of appearances of the torsion parameter. So like the same torsion parameter could be assigned multiple times to the same central bond. And so I'm, I think it's a little more complicated than, than kind of assuming that one is a baseline. Um, I, I would advise against trying to directly interpret this number, but rather to focus on using it as a relative measure. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. It certainly, it certainly points you to the to areas where you you have to um, go for a deeper look. Yeah, exactly. And also, yeah, it's a a kind of weight uh, uh, by the, taking into account also by the number of times uh, that the parameter has been exercised, because uh, otherwise we may end up uh, with uh, yeah some uh, really high. Um, number of violation, but obviously that are due to the fact that uh, this parameter has been used uh, many, many times. So many times used many chances also to produce uh, a violation. Uh, whereas uh, with this uh, kind of normalization, we want to um, essentially, yeah, have a, a bit more clear uh, representation of the, of the picture. Okay. Uh, yeah, anyway, I, I yeah, no, I, I, I would just want to say that uh, this uh, weight can be defined. That, so, I mean, if anyone, uh, anybody finds uh, uh, any better way to define this uh, weight, uh, it, it can be definitely uh, weighted by, well, taking into account some different uh, mathematics. So, uh, yeah. So the other question that I have is this T157. Uh, this is kind of the, I checked um, above and it's the generic uh, atom one bonded to atom two, bonded to atom three, bonded to atom four. So basic, this is where the, the, the force field doesn't produce anything reasonable. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, something uh -huh. where, has anybody looked into what what this what weird bonds these are? Uh, I guess we can have a look. Uh, we can have a look. So I, um, yeah, I'm I'm storing the the smirks uh, here. And I yeah, guess that this, this this is a this... generic fallback per parameter that if nothing else is is found, then it uh, still can. Uh, I think it's somewhere further down. Yeah, here for instance. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, we should see what that gets used for, but. Yeah. Well, it, it should be I guess it should be seen uh, which for what it's used uh, among uh, this um, this data set. So yeah, I might not be able to to answer your question right now. I think this was great. Um, I think it would be great to have a something like a command line tool that runs over a full data set um, that does just this, because we probably have a larger a larger set of molecules, right? Then we want to yeah, run it in a queuing system and maybe create SD files with the QM and the 
MM examples so that we can overlay them and, oh. and take a look. Definitely, but the, in, indeed the, the idea would be to, to use these analysis as a starting point to then uh, uh, launch uh, a, a, torsion, uh, a torsional scan uh, benchmarking with all the violation identified in the same manner as we did uh, for the um, yeah, OpenFF uh, optimized execute. So definitely this is something that we, uh, we would like to, to have at some point. Yeah for, yeah, for us, because we have the QM data already, but we probably have to pick out specific molecules and see if, if the IP situation allows us to share it with, uh, you, with you. Probably some tool that lets us run this on our whole data set and then visualize the, the outliers. Yeah, I think, so right now, the benchmarking team's engineering effort is focused on um, basically refactoring everything. You may have noticed that some steps are like painfully slow, and it's because for for scientific consistency in the data set, we have to stick with the architecture we started out with, uh, and that ended up maybe not being suitable for some of the later analyses that we added. So for the next few months, we're going to focus on re-engineering things, and then we'll be contacting you about a season two in 2022. And I think the violation analysis would be a great tool to include in season two. So we're, we're compiling requests for that now. And I think the violation analysis command line tool will be a great one. Great. Any other discussion, Lorenzo? That's the, the end of your presentation, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. The end of the live session and yeah, also of the of the presentation. So and if that, there are that was really yeah. useful. Thanks, Lorenzo. Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I I just want to thank you all for uh, joining this uh, workshop session. Uh, um, yeah, there will be a follow-up uh, workshop in about uh, two weeks, if I remember well, on bespoke uh, feeding. Uh, one so, week. And one week, sorry. Yeah. yeah so same we, time slot next week. Yeah, you are all uh, invited. Uh, and yeah, so thanks again for uh, for, for joining. Uh, and yeah, well, thanks also for uh, to the OpenFF uh, team for the support uh, provided for uh, yeah uh, setting up this this uh, workshop uh, it has been awesome so yeah thanks again thanks for preparing things that's that that really right. helpful that was very helpful yeah. that's great thanks, thanks. A lot, all. bye 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 okay bye. thank you bye, bye.